Hello, and welcome to Adventures in Neuropathology. Today we're going to be talking about the speech language centers of the brain. If you like this video, please click the like button at the base of your screen. In addition, this video is meant for medical education purposes only and is not intended to be used for medical advice. Okay, let's get started. Today I'm going to be using an image that I acquired from the um, Harvard Brain Tissue Resource Center. It's a great resource. Be sure to check them out when you get a chance. Um, so today's topic is going to be the language centers of the brain and identifying where these centers occur. So whenever we're looking at the brain, we want to identify our landmarks. Um, in order to see uh, where we are and, and um, where different structures are. So our first landmark is going to be this large um, fissure here, which is the sylvian fissure, also known as the lateral sulcus. And the lateral sulcus separates the temporal lobe, which is this lobe underneath, from the frontal lobe, which is this lobe above. So take a look at the lateral sulcus. If we follow it all the way back, it ends at this point here where there's a gyrus that makes kind of an upside down U shape right here. So this is called the supramarginal gyrus. And just behind it is the angular gyrus, but this, this one is the easiest to find. It's the supramarginal gyrus, which um, marks the end point of the lateral sulcus, also known as the sylvian fissure. So the supramarginal gyrus and the angular gyrus form what is known as the uh, Wernicke's region, okay? So Wernicke region is located in this general region and it's a functional region that corresponds to this anatomic location. So let me say that again. It's a functional region, meaning that it is uh, defined by the functional activity of the neurons there. It's not an anatomic region. Uh, it's not an anatomic structure, okay? So Wernicke's area um, holds neurons that are responsible for helping us to understand language. So if someone is speaking to you in uh, a language that you understand, uh, Wernicke's region is um, full of neurons that helps you to understand what someone else is saying to you. Now, I, I'm saying language, but it's not just speech. It's, um, it includes speech as well as written language and also sign language, if that's, a, if that's a mode of language that you understand. Wernicke's area is responsible for helping you to understand language that is coming in that you're processing. Um, so if someone were to get a stroke or some sort of injury in this area, in Wernicke's region, which corresponds to the supramarginal gyrus and also the angular gyrus. If someone was uh, to get an injury to this area, such as a stroke, that person would have a lot of trouble understanding language. Um, so basically, imagine if you go to another country where you don't speak the language and everybody's talking to you and you can hear them producing the words, but you have no idea what they're saying. That would be sort of like the experience of, of a person who has sustained damage to the Wernicke's area. Now, a, a person who has just limited damage to this area would have no problem producing speech. Um, and usually they're not aware that they have a, um, an issue. Um, th they are very much aware if they um, have a problem producing speech, which is located in another area that we'll talk, to, that we'll talk about. But um, a person who has an injury in Wernicke's area, if they have this injury here, 
oftentimes they are not aware that they're not understanding what other people are saying to them, which is very interesting and is um, in the direct opposite of what we'll talk about in just a little bit, talking about the production of language, which is associated with a different area. Okay, so just to recap, word and keys area is associated with understanding language. It is a functional region that can be um, associated in this general anatomic, uh, associated with these general anatomic structures, particularly the supermarginal gyrus. Okay, so we've talked about understanding language, but what about producing language? So what regions of the brain are responsible for producing language? Okay, so this includes producing speech. It also includes writing. Um, and if sign language is your prime, if sign language is your language, then that is involved as well. All right, so in order to find this area, we need to, again, go back to our landmarks. So we already identified this big sulcus here, which is the lateral sulcus, also known as sylvian, sylvian fissure. And notice how there is a, um, there's a gyrus that comes down, kind of loops around and comes back up, okay? Um, and there is a sulcus here kind of in the middle of the brain delineating the front half of the brain, which are the frontal lobes, from the back half of the brain, which this right here is the parietal lobe, okay? So this central sulcus that is centrally located between the front and the back part of the brain, this is called the central sulcus. And notice how the central sulcus, it comes down, it comes down, but it never quite, it never quite meets the lateral sulcus here. It's not contiguous with the lateral sulcus. So the central sulcus is separated from the lateral sulcus by this lip here, okay? So the gyrus that is behind the central sulcus is called the post-central gyrus. The gyrus that is in front of the central sulcus is called the precentral gyrus. Okay, so hold on to that just for a second. The gyri that are in front of the precentral gyrus, which is this guy right here, the gyri that are in front of this precentral gyrus make up the frontal lobe. So these gyri that occupy the superior and lateral aspect of the brain are divided into three gyri. The superior frontal gyrus, the middle frontal gyrus, and the inferior frontal gyrus. And I have these labeled here, okay? So superior, middle, and inferior frontal gyri. Okay, these are kind of oriented from back, from front to back, and they span the frontal lobe, kind of backing up into the precentral gyrus. So again, this is the inferior frontal gyrus. The inferior frontal gyrus can be further subdivided into the pars opercularis, triangularis, and orbitalis. Uh, but don't worry about that. All we need to know is that this is the inferior frontal gyrus. And the posterior aspect of the inferior frontal gyrus, which is located here, corresponds with Broca's area. Okay, so this is uh, the anatomic structure that is the posterior gyrus corresponds with the functional activity known as Broca's area or Broca's region. And Broca's is responsible for the production of language, okay? So this includes speech, but it also includes written um, language as well. So Broca's area is responsible for the production of language. And I want to point out how 
uh, this area that's responsible for the production of language backs up to the precentral gyrus. And remember that the precentral gyrus, this is the primary motor cortex that's responsible for producing motor movement in your arms and your, and your legs. So if you want to move your big toe or you want to move your hand or you want to move a facial, facial muscle, particularly we're talking about voluntary movements, this is going to be the primary motor cortex that is going to affect those changes. And the primary motor cortex can be divided into different areas, okay? So the motor neurons that handle moving muscles of the trunk are located up here. The motor neurons that are responsible for moving muscles in the hand are located about halfway down. And then at the very bottom portion or inferior portion of the precentral gyrus, the motor neurons that are responsible for moving muscles in the face and the mouth are located right here. Notice how the motor neurons that are responsible for moving muscles in the face and the mouth are located right next to Broca's area, which is responsible for the production of language. So we've got a production speech area here located very conveniently right next to the region of the brain that's responsible for controlling the motor movements of the of the face and the mouth okay so Broca's area again is involved in the production of language particularly the production of speech um, and the bottom portion of the precentral gyrus is responsible for the uh, motor muscle movements of the face and mouth that go to the production of speech. So if you think about all the different movements that your tongue makes, that your lips make, that your mouth makes, um, that your facial expressions make when you're communicating to other people, um, this, is a, this is a huge part of the brain that's responsible for, for doing that. So if a person were to have injury to this area, they would have a very hard time producing language. And this includes speech and also written language. And in fact, Broca was a gentleman who uh, first uh, really, really investigated this and described this. And he described this in a, in a, uh, a young man by the name of Tan, T-A-N. And that wasn't his real name, but that was the only intelligible speech that he could produce was the word Tan. So everybody called him Tan. And uh, when, when that person passed away, Broca looked at his brain and found that there was a lesion indeed in this area. And so that, along with a, a lot of other work and research, um, led to this area being named as Broca's area, okay? So production of speech. If a person has um, an injury to this area, they're going to have a lot of uh, trouble producing intelligible language that can be understood by other people. Um, contrary to Wernicke's area, where if a person has an injury to Wernicke's area, they're unable to understand language, but they don't really know that they have a problem. They're not really aware of it. Conversely, when someone has injury to Broca's area, the person is very acutely aware that they are having issues producing language, and they can often get very frustrated by this. Um, so, so that's a, that's, uh, something that's, um, kind of opposite to what we see in Wernicke's area, where in Wernicke's area, the person will have, um, if this area is injured, the person will have issues with understanding language, but they have no issues with the production of language. And oftentimes they'll produce words in what is called a word salad, where it's just kind of words everywhere, but they're not really intelligible. Conversely, if someone has injury in Broca's area, they have issues with producing speech, but they know that they're having issues producing speech and they get very frustrated and irritated by this. 
Okay, so uh, that is our brief review of the um, basic language centers of the of the brain. Um, just one last thing before we close out, I want to point out that um, the image that we're looking at is an image of the left hemisphere. It's the left cerebral hemisphere. And the reason why I'm pointing that out is because the vast majority of people, they have their speech language processing and producing centers located on the left hemisphere. Remember that Broca's area and Wernicke's area, these are functional regions that are associated with these anatomic landmarks. They're functional regions um, that can be in one person, they might be here, and another person, they might be there, and another person might be there. So it just depends on the individual person. It's functional regions that are going to be a little bit different in different people. The vast majority of cases, patients will have, or people will have um, their language centers on the left side of the brain. If we were to look at the mirror image of this brain and we look at the right cerebral hemisphere, the person will still have these anatomic landmarks. They'll still have a supermarginal gyrus on the right side, but there will not be the associated Wernicke's functional activity on the right side as compared. All right, so that is our brief review of the uh, speech and language centers of the brain. Join us next time on Adventures in Neuropathology. Thank you.